I've I had the honor of coming to the Congress many years ago with Mike DeWine and Fran and Fran and Cindy and I and Mike have been close friends for many years. I know of no greater defender of the family, the rights of the unborn, and honesty and integrity in government than Mike DeWine. And I know you appreciate his and Fran's service. Now tell me, does this guy and I look like we were like we were like we were separated at birth or what? Huh? Thank you. Jack Doyle. Jack Doyle, right? Jack, it's wonderful to see you. Uh, now look, here's what I was just thinking about, Jack, is if you'll memorize my speeches, okay, we can we can double our effort all over America. Nobody will ever know. So thank you, Jack, for for that. Really, um, I'd also like to mention uh, my daughter Megan is here. Megan McCain, uh, who is uh, also here. S Cindy's gone home today to uh, check on the whereabouts of our 16-year-old daughter Bridget, and uh, so. Uh, it's uh, important. <laughs> Obviously, there is some importance, and uh, we're very proud of her still being in high school. And as you know, we also have two sons in the military. One who is at the United States Naval Academy, who I was very worried. I was very worried about him for a while because for a while he had no demerits. He could not have been a son of mine. I, I, I was going to check on him. Mayor Mayor Pam Bobst is here. Bobst, Bobst, Bobst. Mayor Bobst, Mayor Pam Bobst. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your great work. Thank you for all your efforts. If I could just mention one brief story. Mayors are important. I don't have to tell anybody here that. Mayors are important. When I was first elected to the United States Senate to succeed Barry Goldwater, um, the uh, woman named Marcella Peters was my chairman in Chandler, Arizona, and we won Chandler, Arizona, and I'd been in the Senate about six months. One night at 2 a.m., the phone rang, and I answered the phone. She said, John. I said, yes. She said, this is Marcella. I said, what is it? She said, I've got a terrible problem. I said, what is it? She says, they're changing the garbage pickup in front of my home from Tuesday morning to Thursday morning. It's terrible. She said, on, uh, on Wednesday night, I have to be down at Republican headquarters. On Thursday morning, I have to be up. Uh, working with the Chandler Republicans Women's Club. The, we, we talked for about 20 minutes, and finally I said, Marcella, why don't you call the mayor of Chandler and discuss this important issue with him? She said, oh, no, I wouldn't want to bother an important man like that <laughs> with an issue this trivial. So, Mayor, thank you for your great work, and we're all very proud of it. Uh, And Rob Frost, who is our chairman of the county GOP, Rob is here also. Rob, where are you? Rob, uh, thank you, Rob. Thank you. Your reward will be in heaven, not here on earth, uh, Rob. Thank you for for your great work. It, it's wonderful to be back in the heartland of America. It's wonderful to be back in a state that has produced presidents, that has produced national leaders, that is one of the most important states in America. And before I go much further, I would like to I'd like to mention to you that since 1964, every single candidate for President of the United States has been elected if they carry the state of Ohio. And so I want to tell you, I realize, I realize, I realize the importance of the heartland of America, and I understand very well many of the challenges that you are facing. But first, let me say, I thank you for being here. I thank you for being here. This is the town hall meeting. This is what American democracy is all about. This is what it's supposed to be about. I will not talk too long. That's hard for a senator, as you know, to say. But uh, I will not talk too long but I, because I want to save as much time as possible for us to talk with each other, to hear your questions and comments or an occasional insult and uh, for me. Because that's what the essence of this campaign is about. That's what the essence of America is about. And that is the town hall meeting. And I intend throughout this campaign 
to maintain this environment and this way of communicating with the American people. You'll probably hear a lot of canned speeches. You'll hear a lot of them, and you have heard a lot of them in the past. But I want the town hall meeting to be the cornerstone of our campaign. And so let me just say I'm very grateful you're here. I appreciate it. And obviously I would appreciate your support a week from tomorrow as, so that I can carry the great state of Ohio and secure the nomination of my party. I, so I, I would be very grateful for it. And then you're going to get sick and tired of me because I'm going to be back and back and back and I'm going to win Ohio and win the presidency of the United States of America with your help and your effort. And I thank you and I'm grateful. I want to talk first of all about our economy. I don't have to tell anyone in this room that we are uh, experiencing the kindest description I say is very big challenges. Whether it be uh, the foreclosure of, of uh, people's homes who can no longer afford their mortgages or whether it be the flight of manufacturing jobs or it be other difficulties and challenges we are facing uh, economically in this country. And my friends, we have to make tax cuts permanent and we have to lower your taxes, not raise your taxes. You do not need a tax increase. And therefore, I think middle income and all Americans need to have their taxes reduced, and I think we need to, especially in challenging economic times, save more of your money for you to spend and not send it to Washington to spend for you. Now, we also need... I just want to mention so several other things. And, and you know, when you mention them, they're not that exciting and they don't fire you up, but we have to take a series of steps. One, we want interest rates to be low. We want tax cuts. We want taxes to be low. We want Americans to be able to afford their home loan mortgage. We want to be able to have the lender and the borrower sit down. And we don't want to, uh, want to reward any, any speculators, and we don't want to reward people who took advantage of and gamed the system. But we also have to continue to working with the FHA, with the Treasury Department, with other agencies of government, so that... Uh, millions of people in America are not deprived of the most, one of the most important parts of the American dream, and that is to own their own home. And I want to tell you, I will actively pursue policies which will allow people to do that. And here in the heartland, again, people are hurting. People are hurting. We know that. We know that. But we will fix these problems, my friends, because America has never faced a challenge that we haven't been able to overcome. And all of us working together, we will... We will be able to do that. One of the reasons why corporations and businesses are leaving America is because the corporation taxes of corporations in America is the second highest in the world. That's why they go places where those are lower. The only country in the world that has higher corporation taxes, corporate taxes, is Japan. We need to lower those corporate taxes so that we can keep businesses, families, and workers in the United States of America. Now, I've got to give you a little straight talk, my friends. Some of those manufacturing jobs are not coming back, and you know that, and I know it. But there is an enormous opportunity, enormous opportunity in green technologies and innovation, and we can attack. We can attack the problem of... of of climate change, I hesitate to use the words global warming on a day like today, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, eliminate our dependence on foreign oil, and the innovation, the technology, and the training, and the education is right here in the state of Ohio and in the heartland of America. And we can develop these technologies. My friends, the greatest innovators are in the world are the United States of America. We, green technologies can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Green technologies such as hybrid cars, such as battery automobiles, such as flexible fuel-driven automobiles, such as nuclear power, such as... I just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> nuclear power, solar, wind, tide, technology. America is the most innovative country in the world. Look at every major technological advance that's been made. 
I'm willing to invest in a battery fr from federal government money in a battery that will take a car 100 to 200 miles before you have to plug it in. I'm willing to invest in pure research and development to develop these new green technologies which will reduce and eliminate our dependence on foreign oil. I'm sure you saw, my friends, last week the price of a barrel of oil went over $100. That means... That means that $400 billion a year, half our trade deficit, is now going to countries in the world, many of which do not like us, and some of that money, let's have a little straight talk, my friends, ends up in the hands of terrorist organizations. We must eliminate our uh, dependence on foreign oil, and we can do it as Americans, and we can do it. I know that we can do that. And let, me, and, and, and let me just remind you that um, uh, there are countries in the world, such as this guy down in Venezuela and other countries, that are not our friends. And we, and we, can't, uh, we can't afford to continue to rely on those sources uh, of oil. And now if I could say a word about nuclear power. My friends, we've had Navy ships sail around the world for more than 60 years with nuclear power plants on them. Nuclear power is safe. The French. We always want to imitate the French. 80% of their electricity is generated by nuclear power. And by the way, in case you missed it, we now have a pro-American president of France, which shows if you live long enough, anything can happen uh, in the world, uh, as you know. So, And let me just give you the other side of the equation, too, because we have a nexus here now of two compelling national security issues, and the other, of course, is climate change, as I mentioned. My friends, let's just suppose this. Just let me put it to you this way, and I won't go on a lot, a long time on it, but suppose that those of us that think that climate change is taking place and is affecting our planet uh, are wrong, and, uh, and there's just no such thing. We are we're not correct. But we develop these technologies, wind, solar, nuclear, uh, all unleash all, all of the technology and innovation that America is capable of, and then all we've done is give our kids a cleaner planet. That's all we've done. But suppose that we are right and do nothing. Suppose we are right or do nothing. You know, there's, there's pollution from China today that is affecting Los Angeles. This is a global problem. And I just want to state to you right now, I will enter, enter into international agreements that are, uh, uh, that, that are effective, but we can't do it without India or China in it. And the second thing is that, again, we will spur innovation. And, my friends, the world's largest corporations, Gen corporation, General Electric, has devoted themselves to green technology. This is the path to restoring the strength of America's economy. We can do that. And so please believe me when I tell you that our, in, our need for independence of foreign oil and our need to address this climate change issue have reached a nexus, and I know that the American people will respond if asked. I'd like to say a couple more, mention a couple more issues. By the way, in case you missed it, in Cuba, uh, Raul Castro, that uh, the, the young Turks have taken over, obviously. Uh, there is a youth movement there in Cuba. Um, I'm only half kidding. He's 76. That's not very old, you know. So, uh, uh, but my friends, I, I, I'm, a, I'm saddened today. Not surprised, uh, but saddened because the people of Cuba obviously are going to be saddled for some period of time with this dictatorial, repressive, oppressive regime uh, that, that it forces them to drive automobiles from the 1950s that uh, has, we have most importantly, far, far more importantly, is that they still have prisons that are full of political prisoners and they've been de deprived of the human rights. I want to tell you, I will maintain the embargo on Cuba and I will encourage them absolutely to move forward Emp empty empty the prisons of political prisoners, allow human rights organizations to function in Cuba, and have a free and fair election. That's what people in all over our hemisphere and all over the world deserve. So, I, I want to I say a word about uh, one of the major, getting back to the economy for a second, 
One of the reasons why our economy is in the shape that it's in today, my friend, is directly related to the irresponsible, wasteful, disgraceful uh, spending, out of control spending in Washington, D.C. I will fix that. I will stop. I will stop the earmark spending. I will stop it. I will stop it, my friends, and uh, we Republicans, we Republicans dispirited our base because we let spending get out of control, as you well know, and it led to corruption. And I'm sorry to say that, but the fact is that it dispirited our base. And obviously, we all know the tipping point was when we heard about the bridge in Alaska to an island with 50 people on it, $233 million bridge. By the way, you may not have noticed, some years ago we decided to spend $3 million to study the DNA of bears in Montana. Uh, I don't know if that was a paternity issue or a criminal issue, <laughs> but we did that. We did that. You know, I, I steal a lot of lines from Ronald Reagan, but one of them that I've stolen from him is he used to say, Congress spends money like a drunken sailor, only he never knew a sailor drunk or sober with the imagination of Congress. And I, I you know, I, I like that line. And I use it a lot. I'm not making this up. When I tell you about six months ago, I received an email from a guy that said, as a former drunken sailor, I resent being compared to members of Congress. You can't blame the guy. You can't blame him. So, so, so let me put this in terms that, that bring it home, I think, uh, more graphically. Uh, in the last two years, the, the Congress and the President passed, signed into law uh, two massive spending bills in which were $35 billion of earmarked pork barrel spending. Okay, $35 billion. Now, for that $35 billion, you could have had a $1,000 tax credit for every single child in America. Now, w w w the choice is there. Do we want bridges and DNA of bears and and libraries and museums and all this uh, stuff and a lot of that waste is in defense, my friends? Or would we rather give a thousand dollar tax credit to every child in America? I think we know the answer. And that's why I've got an old pen that Ronald Reagan gave me years ago and I'm going to take that pen and every pork barrel project, a single earmark project on a bill, I will veto. I will veto. And I will make sure that the Americans restore their faith in our spending. I want to say a word to our veterans, and then I want to talk about uh, national security with you, and, I, and I'll stop. First of all, to our veterans, thank you for your service. Thank you from our greatest generations to, to everyone who has served. Thank you so much for being here. Our veterans are going to need a lot of care. This is a tough war, my friends. You and I know it. A lot of sacrifice has been made, and it's very, very tough. And we're going to have to expand the military medical capability and the VA's capability to treat T PTSD and for these terrible wounds that are the result of these IEDs, as you, as you know. And um, we're going to have to expand our capability to care for them. And um, I, I understand that, and you understand that. George Washington, back in 1789, said that the ability to, for the willingness of young people to serve their nation in time of war is directly related to how previous generations are treated who served and sacrificed. George Washington was right in 1789 as he is today. So here's the problem with veterans health care today, my friends. Too often, ask our friends, ask our friends, too often, they have to get in line and drive for, they have to drive for an hour to get to a VA facility, to stand in line, to get an appointment, to get an appointment. My friends, that's not right. And what I'm going to do, and what I'm going to do is give for a routine health care need, give our veterans a plastic card, say take that plastic card, and when you have a routine health care need, take it to the doctor or the health care provider of your choice and get immediate care. That's what our veterans need and deserve. That's what they need and deserve. Thank you. And we're going to fix health care in America, and we're going to have the highest quality health care in the world preserved, and we're not going to have a government takeover of it, and we're going to have, peop have families decide and make their choices, and not the government. 
And there's a lot of other issues that we can talk about, but let me just say, I'm running for president, my friends, because I believe we face a transcendent challenge of the 21st century. That challenge, obviously, is a great evil. It's one of the greatest evils that this nation has ever encountered. And you know it is far more widespread in many ways and far more pervasive than maybe we anticipated after 9-11. If I'd have told you right after 9-11 that a group of doctors in Scotland, doctors, educated people in Scotland, would get together and get this jihadist message, this extremist message, and want to become suicide bombers and go out and destroy the airport in Glasgow, Scotland. That was not our stereotype. That was not the one we thought. And my friends, there's been arrests in Germany and Denmark. The head of the CIA has said Al-Qaeda is trying to establish uh, uh, cells in the United States. It's a transcendent evil. I don't have to bore you with, with what you already know. But don't forget how evil this is. Don't forget that this is a, an evil that's hard for us to comprehend, so we, we shy away from it. I'm sure you saw in Baghdad just a short time ago, these Al-Qaeda people put explosive vests on mentally disabled young women, put them into a marketplace, and by remote control, detonated, killing them. And, and it's not, you know, How evil is that? How terrible is that? They will do anything to destroy us. So this is a transcendent challenge. And we will never surrender. We will never surrender. And they will. And I want to assure you of that. And I want to assure you... Thank you. And I want to mention one other, one other person to you. Somewhere, uh, so we are told, either in Afghanistan or Pakistan, resides a guy who regularly gets out messages to these evil people, and he motivates and recruits and he instructs them. And my friends, his name, as we all know, is Osama bin Laden. And I want to tell you, if I have to follow him to the gates of hell, I'll get Osama bin Laden. I'll get him. I promise. I promise I will get him. Just let me say, no, I know the war in Iraq is a sad, a sad and frustrating situation. I know that it has divided America. And the service and sacrifice of so many brave young Americans is saddening to all of us. And I know how frustrating it is. It has frustrated me for a period of time when the Rumsfeld strategy I knew was failing and I argued for this new strategy. And my friends, America is divided about this war and I understand that. But thank God none of us are divided in our support of the men and women who are serving in the military today in uniform. So let me just say, we are succeeding in Iraq. The, all the indicators are there. It's long and hard and tough, and if you forget everything I tell you, please remember this. Al-Qaeda is on the They're not defeated. They're on the run, but they're not defeated. And I want to tell you, I, we're going to have in this election stark differences. They are liberal Democrats. I am a conservative Republican. One of those differences will be about this strategy. And they were wrong, Senator Clinton and Senator Obama, when they said that the surge would fail. And they were wrong when they said that the political process would not move forward. There have been a series of laws. By the way, including the Iraqi parliament has now enacted a budget, something we've been incapable of doing in our nation's capital. And by the way, isn't it embarrassing, worse than embarrassing, when the Congress, when the House of Representatives of the United States of America goes out on recess when we have not addressed this incredible threat of the intelligence capabilities of this country to monitor the communications of bad people. It's disgraceful. It's disgraceful. We, the head of the CIA, the, the director of national intelligence has said it's hurting our ability to combat Al-Qaeda. Uh, uh, my friends, that, that, that's not right. That's not right. 
But back to Iraq a second. It, it's succeeding. It is succeeding. It's long and it's hard and it's tough. But I believe that General Petraeus may be one of the finest generals America has ever been blessed with. And I appreciate his leadership, his leadership and his service. A lot of us, when we were young, uh, had to read a book called Mr. Lincoln Finds a General. I'm sure that some of you may remember. Well, I think Mr. Mr. Bush has found a general too. And so, but the fact is, it's the brave young men and women who are serving and who are doing such a magnificent job. And my friends, I know that you know that my campaign was declared dead on several occasions, to be blunt. Uh, there's a couple of times where I was reminded of the words of Chairman Mao, who said, it's always darkest before it's totally black. And, but the fact is, uh, I believed... I believe this new strategy would succeed in Iraq, not because I'm the smartest guy in the world, but because I study and because I've had 20 years of experience in every major national security challenge this nation has faced. And therefore, I believe I'm experienced and I have the judgment necessary to lead against this transcendent evil. And every once in a while, every once in a while, you have an experience in our lives that puts everything into the right perspective. And that happened to me in Wolfboro, New Hampshire, last August at a town hall meeting. A woman stood up at the town hall meeting and she said, Senator McCain, will you do me the honor of wearing a bracelet with my son's name on it? My son, Matthew Stanley, was 22 years old. He was killed in combat outside of Baghdad just before Christmas last year. I said, I'd be honored to wear that bracelet with your son's name on it. And then she said, Senator McCain, I want you to promise me one thing. I want you to promise me that you'll do everything in your power to make sure that my son's death was not in vain. My friends, I will, I will lead America, and I will do everything that I can to assure Matthew Stanley's mother and all the family members of those who have sacrificed that it will not only not be in vain, but I will bring our troops home, and I will bring them home with honor and in victory. And that's what we as America, this country can do, and that's what I'll do for it. So, my friends, could I just by a close by saying I would be grateful for your support a week from tomorrow. I want to tell you that my main job will be to inspire Americans to serve a cause greater than their self-interest. There's nothing nobler. I've had the great honor of serving this country since I was 17 and raised my hand and took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States when I entered the United States Naval Academy long, long ago. I've been proud to serve. I'd be honored to have the opportunity to serve a little while longer. And I promise you, I know I can inspire Americans to serve causes greater than their self-interest and maintain the greatest nation in the world in the 21st century as we were in the 20th and be, as our, as our beloved Ronald Reagan used to say, a shining city on a hill. Thank you for being with me today, and I'd like to respond to any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, if, if uh, someone would just raise your hand, we have some people. Yes, sir, right there. Would you hang on just a minute? We usually use the microphone. Yes, go ahead. Senator, other than the Iraqi war, the huge problem in my mind is the immigration problem. And in a very few years, we're not going to be the United States as we know it. So how would you deal with this huge complex problem. Thank you, sir. Uh, we, must, we must secure our borders first. We must secure our borders first, and that's the message. The message is that the American people don't want to repeat, as you may recall, in 1986 we passed a law that said we would secure our borders, and we didn't. And I come from a border state. I know how to secure those borders. And I would have our border state governors certify that those borders are secure. And that has to be done so that when you cut off the flow, then you are able to have tamper-proof biometric documents for temporary workers for work jobs that are needed for them to do. And 
that way you would prosecute employers who employ people who come here illegally to the fullest extent of the law by only having tamper-proof biometric documents. As far as the other, uh, the people who are here illegally, first of all, it will dry up some of them, as you know. Second, our, we have an obligation to round up and deport the two million people, according to Secretary Chertoff, have committed crimes in this country. They have to be uh, deported, um, rounded up and deported, or prosecuted, if necessary, as quickly uh, as possible. And then we sit down and we address it with a principle that no one who has come here illegally will take any precedence over those who came here legally or waited legally for the opportunity to do so. Did you? And could I ask our, our folks, we do ha allow follow-up, so if you do have a follow-up, we uh, so you can have the microphone to follow up if you'd like. Well, my history is I worked for immigration, and I'm glad to hear that we're going to start enforcing the law. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, sir. And, 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 and could I say, my friends, uh, the rules here, if you feel that you need to follow up, because there's been an occasion or two when I have not answered the question. <laughs> so not often, not often. And uh, so we, we give a, uh, a chance to respond. Yes, ma'am. As a retired teacher, I'd like to know your feeling about the violence that is going on in the colleges and in the elementary and high school, and if there's something that can be done in the federal government or when you become president, because it's becoming really out of hand. Thank you. Um, obviously, we need to address not only the the most visible and terrible and tragic situations of this people going to schools and killing fellow students and faculty members and innocent bystanders and by the way one of the one of the answers to that in my view is that anybody who obtains uh, or uses a gun in the commission of a crime should have there should be mandatory jail sentences I really believe that that, that that's one of the fundamentals here that that we need to pursue uh, I, I think that teachers should be empowered to be and have more latitude for discipline in the schools. I think that, sh that, that students I think that students that are unruly and disruptive, frankly, uh, should that the teachers should be allowed and the principals and others not have to be afraid of a lawsuit uh, if they carry impose discipline in the schools. One of the things we've seen in a lot of the charter schools, and I'm a big charter school advocate, not as a replacement for public schools, but as competition for public schools, that 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 they are given that they are given many times in the charter schools more disciplinary capabilities, uh, including expulsion, that uh, I think serve as a deterrence. The third thing, obviously, we need more good teachers. You know that better than anybody. We need more good teachers, and how do you do that? You recruit them, you pay them more, you reward them, and you find bad teachers another line of work. And, uh, and so the real answer in the classroom is quality teachers, and we've got to encourage, we've got to provide scholarships, we've provide, got to do every possible thing we can, including significant rewards for good teachers. That was the intent, one of the major intents of Child, No Child Left Behind. And by the way, in New York City, they have done something phenomenal. As you probably know, you're nodding your head in rewarding good teachers, and they say that they're going to even close bad, bad performing schools if, if necessary. So choice and competition, I think. And by the way, homeschooling works in many, if you've got a dedicated parent. And so we've got to give choice and competition in the school system. But I'm very worried about it. It's obviously a, a huge problem, but I think a lot of it also comes back to the school board and the teachers and the principals, but they should be given the latitude to do what they need to do to make sure that there's not 
these repetitions of the tragedies, but also that there's an environment of learning in the classroom. And by the way, my wife Cindy was a teacher of special education, which is obviously a very special kind of talent, and I'm very grateful for those teachers. And finally, 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 and I've over-answered the question, we've got to look at this issue of autism. As you know, there's a larger number of children who are autist autistic, and that's going to put a, a, a very significant challenge to our education system. Yes, ma'am. There's a microphone coming right there. What are you going to do to make the future safer? The future safer? Uh, I, I think that, first of all, from a national security standpoint, I believe that we'll take on this, we'll take on this global struggle against the transcendent evil that I talked about before. But I also think that uh, there are other challenges to make your neighborhoods and your cities and your towns safer. Uh, you know, there's a great guy that uh, happened to have run for president on our side on our, from our political party, and he was mayor of New York City. His name was Rudy Giuliani. And when he came to be mayor of New York City, uh, in many respects, the city was not a safe place for people like my family from Arizona to go and visit. And he carried out some very uh, incredibly effective policies that basically uh, just in just a few years you and I could walk down the street in almost every part of New York City, not every part, but certainly in areas that had not been safe before such as Times Square and other areas. And he did it by enforcing the law, by empowering his police, members of the police, by getting justice done as quickly as possible, and basically enforcing existing laws in a very strict fashion where it became an environment at, uh, where lawlessness, where the, the, the squeegee people, where the street people, where the people didn't feel, where there was an environment of security. And I think that uh, when you look at some of our cities now, Philadelphia is one of them, some of them that are that we are seeing rising kind kind of, uh, of uh, cr uh, tide of crime that we're going to have to look maybe back at what Mayor Giuliani did in, in New York City and, be, and employ some of those tactics uh, as well. But it also gets back to education and it also gets back to opportunity. Yes, sir. But uh, uh, young lady, I, I just want to say to you again. Your question is excellent. It would be the subject of a many hour discussion, but thank you for thank you for your question. Yes, sir. Senator McCain. Uh, as one veteran to another, welcome home. Thank you, sir. I do have a question concerning uh, what you're referring to in medical fee basis for veterans. It has been used within the Department of Veterans Affairs for many years. There are a lot of problems with it, and if this were to be as the Commander-in-Chief, a directive that you were to be given to the Department of Veterans Affairs Secretary, how would that be implemented? Do you have an idea on that? Well, you know, there's a, there's a program now called TRICARE, as you know, and uh, maybe you want to keep the microphone. I think you, you know about, about that program, and it basically provides them with what I was describing earlier. You know, it gives them the ability to go to health care providers and doctors of their choice. And, and that's along the lines of what I'm talking about. And I wonder if you agree or disagree with that. I have some varying degree with uh, how that is uh, worked out and how it's accepted. Uh, but if you look at the Department of Veterans Affairs medical fee-based services and how that has worked for the handicapped and disabled within the, t the framework of their community, it's worked outstanding for those few veterans that fall within that umbrella. But on a larger picture, this is going to cost a lot of money. Yes, sir. It is going to be phenomenal so far as a budget, and how is that budget going to be uh, enthusiastically accepted by Congress, in your opinion, to be, a, 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 to be implemented? Well, first of all, I... Uh, I think that one thing Americans are united on, as I mentioned earlier, is support for our veterans. I, I know of no one who is not in support of them. 
my thrust of my effort, as I tried to explain earlier, PTSD can only be treated by military medical or the VA, as we know. I mean, there's no, there's nobody else in the world that can treat those. The the wounds, such as from IEDs and the ones we see at Walter Reed and Bethesda, etc. So I want the VA to really be able to focus and expand on those things they do best, okay? And then some of the routine stuff, so that the, and probably in the Phoenix VA today, there's people standing in lines that you are very familiar with. And a lot of that could be taken care of uh, routine health care providers. Now, that's part of the problem that we've got to reduce the inflation associated with health care all over America and preserve the highest quality health care there is in the world. But we've got to take care of our veterans uh, first and primarily. Go ahead. One Go ahead. more. Yes, sir. Traumatic brain injury as yes, a result of IEDs and those uh, that are suffering from that and the correlation with PTSD. It's been a long battle in trying to decipher which it is that, it, that the veteran is suffering from. I would hope that as our president and commander-in-chief that we carry that forward and continue the research on that on those two areas. Will and I just add one more, and I don't want to drag out the conversation with you, but Burns, we are making tremendous progress, but not nearly enough on treatment of Burns. If you've been down in San Antonio at Brook Army Hospital, they're, they're doing phenomenal things, but we have to spend a lot more effort to... to Fix, fix that problem. I, th I think you would agree. Yes, yes ma'am. Senator, I'm speaking to you as a Blue Star mother, and so I believe that I do understand what service to country means. Yes, ma'am. I only have two things to say. I want to thank you for yours, and I want to tell you how gosh darn excited I am that a man with your integrity and wisdom is headed to the White House. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. If, uh, if you're not busy between now and a week from Tuesday, I'd love to have you travel around with us around the state. Yes. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Sir, in your opinion, um, what would be some benchmarks as far as progress in Iraq um, that you feel would need to be met before our troops came home? I, on the issue of question, what a benchmark. I just got a briefing a couple of days ago. There are some, I believe, 15 benchmarks which a year ago we were succeeding in only one or two. Now almost all of them we are either making progress or have succeeded. The main benchmark is the ability of the Iraqi military to take over these responsibilities and our troops being able to withdraw to the support role. In Mosul today, there's a big battle g brewing because Al-Qaeda is one of their last outposts. The majority of that effort is being c carried out by Iraqi military, not by American military. That's our goal. And I believe that what we can see is the classic counterinsurgency where the Iraqis take over the responsibilities, our people are more and more in support roles, and we gradually withdraw. And by the way, that reminds me of this hundred year thing. I was asked at a town hall meeting back and forth, how long would we have a presence in Iraq? My friends, the war will be over soon. The war, for all intents and purposes, although the insurgency will go on for years and years and years, but it'll be handled by the Iraqis, not by us. And then we decide what kind of security arrangement we want to have with the Iraqis. You might know that we have major base in Kuwait because the first Gulf War, after we won, we had a base arrangement with the, with the Kuwaitis. In Korea, we've had, as you know, ever since the Korean War, we've had military presence in South Korea. So uh, my Democrat friends like to distort that comment. But the fact is that the benchmarks are very clearly the capability of the Iraqi military, and every single day that is improving. 
and we take American young men and women out of harm's way. And one of those benchmarks, by the way, is also the political pro progress. Now, I'm going to give you a little bad news, uh, because, I, because you need straight talk. The furthest behind we are, my dear friends, is in the rule of law. The rule of law is the fundamental and most difficult part of, of building any democracy. And this is a country that was ruled with an iron fist by one of the most cruel and despotic dictators in history. And you know who the number one target of al-Qaeda is in Iraq, my friends? Judges. Judges. Because they know that if the rule of law is, is, is effective, then that, that's their demise. So the benchmark I worry about more than any other, uh, in, in my opinion, is the ability of the legal system to protect all of the citizens uh, of the country of Iraq. And I'm sorry to tell you that that's still a long way to go, but should not affect significantly our military presence there. Yes, sir? I was just wondering if you could talk about uh, the issue of the draft and whether we're going to need to reinstate that or not. Um, did everybody hear the question? The issue was the draft. Um, um, we won't draft anyone but you. Uh, <laughs> uh, spe pass a special piece of legislation. Uh, be sure to give me your name and all relevant information before. My, my friends, we have the most professional, best equipped, best trained military in the history of this country. And so there is no reason to restore the draft, but there is reason to expand our Army and our Marine Corps and our Navy and our Air Force. Uh, the Army and Navy, I mean, excuse me, the Army and Marine Corps are one third smaller than they were at the size of the first Gulf War. And obviously, one of the many mistakes that was made under Secretary Rumsfeld is we didn't expand the Army and the Marine Corps. And I'm telling you, we'll recruit them. There's brave and patriotic young Americans. There's also young Americans who reach age 18, 19, 20, etc., and they look at their options. And among them are to provide them incentives, them incentives to serve their country, educational benefits, pay, medical care, etc., and there's, we're a country of 300 million people. There's no reason why we shouldn't be, go ahead and expand our Army and Marine Corps. And I'd like to tell you, my friends, that we have this transcendent challenge, and it's going to require a very effective, best equipped, best trained military uh, that we can have. And I didn't even talk about it today, but if there's a question about it, we have significant challenges in Afghanistan, my friends. The poppy crop is up. The uh, situation in Pakistan is dicey. But by the way, I was glad to see that the elected government now, parliamentary majority in Pakistan, has agreed to work with President Musharraf. That can be a step in the right direction. Yes, sir. And then, then we'll go right in front. Yes, sir. Thank you for your service. Um, as a father of a young man who will be entering the Naval Academy this summer, how are you Tell going to... Tell him to watch out for my son. <laughs> um, how are you going to make sure that equipment and troops and everything in the past they've had a hard time moving stuff to the front lines and getting all the guys the right stuff when they need it are you going to be uh, and building stuff back to the uh, Reagan days when we actually had levels that we could maintain these different conflicts and different things and uh, second note uh, the Army Navy game next year <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little bit superstitious so I I think that's a little uh, early, but I can assure you I, I would be totally unbiased in my view of the, of the game. Um, my friends, when you look at, at what there have been problems and there will be problems, and most of those are being fixed, but there will always be problems uh, cropped up. When you look at the way we supply, equip, train, uh, feed, uh, these people are brave young men and women halfway around the world. It's really remarkable the capability that we in the military have. It, we can always improve it. There's always areas where we need to improve. We're getting the MRAPs over there now much more quickly. For a while we didn't. I can look back and show you mistakes and errors that have been made. But overall, it's remarkable capability to get the kind of equipment and supplies and, and the trained individuals in the way we do uh, all the way over in that part of the world. It, it is a remarkable thing we've been able to do. And it can always, always be improved. 
but when I go over there and I ask them a lot of the questions and they're pretty frank with me, there's always problems. And if any military isn't complaining, there's something really wrong. But at the same time, the, the pride that they feel in what they're doing and their efficiency and their capabilities is remarkable. Yes, sir, all the way in the back. I didn't hear the question, I'm sorry. The Good Friday Agreement as far as the Palestinians and Israelis are concerned? Oh, Northern Ireland. Oh, I, listen, I'm, I'm very pleased that's what happened, what's happened in Northern Ireland. That's why you don't read about it anymore. Uh, the, for the first time, uh, Protestants and Catholics are working together and I can only point out to you one thing, and that is when I first went to Northern Ireland 20 years ago into Belfast, there was 80 and 90 percent unemployment, and violence was high, and the British military were there basically preventing chaos. One of the things that happened is you now go to those same places, and there's 90 percent employment, and, and that has made a huge difference in Ireland, so people are, are able to have better lives for themselves. My friends, I know that you know this. The, remark, the economic miracle of Europe is Ireland, and, uh, and that has played a big role. And there's a whole lot of other things, but that has also played a big role in having people sit down and dispute, settle their disputes over the negotiating table rather than, um, rather than through the bullet, the gun, and the bomb. But the Good Friday Agreements are a great beginning, and I am convinced that we are really solidly on the right path uh, after centuries uh, of uh, discord and conflict. Senator, welcome back to Northeast Ohio. As you know, we have many terrific assets here in this region, but we are also plagued with no growth in population and sprawl. I would love to hear a little bit about your urban agenda on how we can try to build back up our aging metropolitan areas. This is Mayor Debbie Sutherland, a great mayor who I did not recognize earlier in an act of incredible stupidity. I apologize, and I apologize, Mayor, and I thank you for your great service as well, and I thank you. Um, I'd say one of the areas that we have, to, uh, we have to look at very carefully, again, is the way we spend money on transportation uh, in Washington and infrastructure. I would like to see, first of all, a lot of the money that now leaves Ohio goes to Washington and then comes back to Ohio, stay in Ohio, okay? That the gas tax was originally imposed to build the national transportation highway, national highway system. We've completed the national highway system some years ago. And so too often the money goes to Washington, you lose some of it along the way in the bureaucracy, and then individuals that have nothing to do with the state of Ohio or the mayor uh, of Bay Village uh, make decisions that you should be making, that the governor and the legislature should be making, rather than having someone make the decision uh, because of his or her seniority and influence uh, in the Congress of the United States. I think that's the first thing. The second thing I, I think we need to do um, is to establish a set of national priorities. We have an aging infrastructure here in the state of Ohio. We all know that. We have a dramatically growing state in Arizona where we need new projects as well. And it seems to me that nationally, using the governors, because I think the governors are less utilized, frankly, than, than maybe they should be since they are very close to the, they and the legislators, sit down and let's set out a, a plan for national priorities and where is it that our greatest needs are. And then I think it's very important that we talk about funding and where that funding comes from and where the federal responsibility is and where the state and local responsibility is. And those things I think can be sorted out through a series of, of negotiations and getting credible people who will set those priorities for us and then we endorse them or not. Now, I am reluctant. In fact, I'm not only reluctant, I think the worst thing we can do right now is raise people's taxes. I just don't think it's right. I think that it would harm our economy further. But I, but I also think there's so much money 
that is being wasted in Washington. And I know, oh, he's talking about government waste. I was talking about that $35 billion that went to earmark projects as opposed to projects by any reason of, of priority. And so the first thing that I would do is make sure that the money is going to the right places and we would set up a system which we have something of, but it's certainly not effective because it's overridden by congressional intent. I don't know if you saw lately whether we now have these committee reports uh, on, on, on spending bills that nobody sees that we vote on before it's even printed. I mean, it's remarkable. It's, it's remarkable. And so I think we take those monies and we start investing them, but we also have much closer coordination with the state and local governments so priorities can be set that really are the most important priorities of those states and local places. And I also, by the way, believe in technology, and I think that we have a uh, good development for a uh, chance of development for high-speed transportation, which is being put in in many cities around America, including uh, my home city of Phoenix, and I also think probably that sometime sooner or later Amtrak should stand on its own or we should stop the uh, incredible subsidies on wasteful and inefficient routes. I just thought I'd throw that in since I've been battling them for, for years. Yes, ma'am. All the way in the back there. Yes, she has. Senator McCain. My question is about North Korean nuclear problem. What is your strategy to deal with that issue? It seems like the six-party talks is not moving forward. Do you have a different strategy from that of Bush administration? Thank you. Yes. Um, and Mayor, could I just say again, when I travel, particularly in the Midwest, in the heartland of America, these questions are compelling. And I believe that we have to have a coordination and a level of cooperation between governors, state, local officials, and the federal government that is missing uh, today. And I do think that, that we have sufficient funds at least to move forward on a lot of these projects that are stalled because the money is simply being spent on projects and priorities that are, that are not relevant. I think most people that are experts would agree. But I am certainly not oblivious to the significant aging infrastructure problems, beginning with bridges, for example. Uh, and they're part of a national security issue when we look at some of our transportation hubs that have to be made a lot secure than they are today. Um, as in the case of North Korea, I, uh, I respectfully would like to go back to Ronald Reagan's uh, adage uh, during the Cold War where he said, trust but verify. And I believe that the North Koreans have been dragging their feet. I believe that the new um, leader of South Korea is much more committed to human rights than his predecessor was. Uh, many of you may not know, but the largest existing gulag in the world is in North Korea. This is one of the most despotic Orwellian regimes on earth, probably the most. Um, I'm glad to see that the Philharmonic uh, the, is going to perform in North Korea. I would like to see the North Korean people be able to have a radio they can listen to. Uh, I'd like for us to understand that because of this regime, I'm told that the average North Korean is three inches shorter than the average South Korean because of the incredible conditions of nutrition and deprivation that have existed there for a long period of time. So I don't, uh, I'm not in favor of confrontation with North Korea, but I do think we need to advocate more human rights and we also need to have a better verification of what the North Koreans are doing vis-a-vis -vis nuclear weapons. There was an attack uh, by the Israelis on a facility in Syria. I do not have any inside information or any intelligence, but there is uh, allegations that the North Koreans were involved there and that they've been involved in money laundering and the drug trade and other illicit activities as well. So, and finally on the quote six party talks, I think it, one of the most overrated aspects of diplomacy is, is talks. 
Uh, for example, I don't know why in the world you would want to sit down with Raul Castro under no conditions before. I have no idea what what that what that would do, except except perhaps enhance the prestige of a guy who was really the enforcer for Fidel Castro for long periods of time. So, I would just remind you, way back when the North when uh, when Lyndon Johnson decided to stop the bombing of North Vietnam, we had four party talks in Paris. They fought for about two years over the si size and shape of the table until B-52s appeared over Hanoi, and then they decided they wanted to talk and talk badly. So um, I hope that we will trust but verify when I think North Korea poses a threat. I think the Chinese and the Russians are being very unhelpful in, in addressing this issue, and we have every right to expect more cooperation from them. It's a very serious national security challenge. I do believe we can see our way through it. My friends, I uh, am told by my, by my staff that, uh, I will, that we have to stop. I want to say thank you. I want to say I'll be back. And please remember a week from Tuesday, I want you to remember the words of the late Mayor Daley of Chicago who said, Vote early and vote often. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here. Thank you so much.